Okay. Okay, everybody. Uh, welcome um, to all, all of you here uh, tonight. Um, in a minute, we're going to establish contact with Kate Clancy. Uh, it's great to see so many people here. And also, if anybody's watching on the live stream, um, thanks for joining us. Um, if, uh, if you are on the live stream, I think you're going to have the chance to put questions at the end. Um, just type those in uh, as you're instructed. Uh, the way it's going to play is this, that we're going to have uh, a discussion with Kate for about 40 minutes, maybe 45, and then uh, I'm going to throw it open to the floor for questions. Um, the event, this event is sponsored by Guernsey Post, and we're very grateful to them for, for that, because without our sponsors, we really wouldn't be able to uh, organise this event. The other thing about Kate is that most of you might know this, but... Um, Kate has already been the judge of the Guernsey International Poetry Competition, with that, which had record entries. We've just actually done the awards for it, which went really well. So, um, uh, have we got Kate on the line? Yes. It's, uh, oh, Kate. I, I can yeah, hear you, Kate. you can oh, see hi, me now. Kate. Oh, can great. you see me? Yeah. I've been yeah, able to yeah. see you uh, the award ceremonies for the poems, which was, it was lovely to see. Well, well, it was. It's really great to 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 see you here. I know that we've been planning for two years to get you over to Guernsey. Oh, and I, I am so sad that I'm not actually there. I really am <laughs> to see the what, sea and be in Guernsey. Yeah. Damn it! Well, this, <laughs> the sea is. Uh, I would have got on any available boat. I did tell Katrina that I would have got on any boat, but here we go. No one was. No one would let me. Well, maybe next year. <laughs> maybe next year. Maybe next year. Yeah. yeah. So um, it's great to see you. Um, and we had ex I had expected to have you sitting here by me, but uh, there we are. So what I'm going to do, Kate, first of all, is I'm just going to say a little bit of introduction about you. And then, uh, and then if we go into some questions. And at the end, probably we'll have time for maybe 15, 20 minutes of questions from the audience as well, if that's okay. Right. Now, um, don't get embarrassed by the things I say about you, because I've always <laughs> liked your writing, but there we go. Now, Kate Clancy, I think, is a very special writer, because she's, she can write across all genres, it seems to me. So, poetry, fiction, drama, memoir, journalism. And the thing is, she seems to be good at all of them. So, her poetry collections, which include Slattern, Samarkand, Newborn, um, have won uh, many accolades. She's won the um, Eric Gregory Award, Somerset Morn Award, and the Forward Prize. But then, in sh her short stories as well, her short story, The Not Dead and the Saved, won the V.S. Pritchard Prize and the BBC National Short Story Award. And her novel, Meeting the English, was shortlisted for the Costa. Um, not only that, but she writes drama and has had a number of uh, dramas produced and adaptations produced on Radio 3 and Radio 4. The first thing I read of Kate's was uh, a book called Antigona's, uh, Antigona and Me. Now, that book is a memoir, and it's a memoir about her dealings with and her growing understanding of a young Kosovan refugee to whom she gives a job. I absolutely loved that book. And so did many others, because it won the Writers Guild Award. Now, Kate's also a journalist, and she writes for a number of publications, including The Guardian, where she recently had published an extremely moving and honest long read, which was called Letting Go, My Battle to Help My Parents Die a Good Death. Um, in 2018, uh, Kate was awarded the MBE for Services to Literature. But, now I didn't really know much about this, but Kate's also a teacher, and she's been a teacher for 30 years in schools as, as well as in universities, and also she teaches creative writing with the Arvon Foundation. And her most recent work, or much of her most recent work, draws on her experience in schools. Um, so the anthology England Poems from a School, which she edited from the work of her poetry group, at her Oxford Spires Comprehensive. And the book we'll be talking about mostly today, which is Some Kids I Taught and What They Taught Me. Um, it won the Orwell Prize for political writing, and the judges said this about the book. In this book, a brilliantly honest writer tackles a subject that ties so many people up in knots, 
education, and how it is inexorably dominated by class. Yet this is the very opposite of a worthy lecture. Clanche's reflections on teaching and the stories of her students are moving, funny, full of love, and offer sparkling insights into modern British society. Um, Philip Pullman described the book as the best book on teachers and children and writing that I've ever read. Now, I've, as a retired teacher, I've read many books on education, many of them. Uh, none of them have grabbed me as strongly as this one from beginning to end. So, Kate, I'd like to start off by asking <laughs> you, can you tell us why you decided to write some kids? And maybe explain um, who the children are that you chose to write about. And also, were you surprised by the quality of the poems that they wrote? <laughs> Well, the quality of their poems was kind of a 10 year ongoing project. And so they got better and better as they taught me how to teach them. So that's one thing. When I d also decided to start writing, or you don't decide to start writing, I had my first idea for some kids I taught and what they taught me about 10 years ago. So it was a fairly long uh, you know, process. And, and I thought I told my editor at Picador, I said, I'm writing some essays about teaching. And they, they said, Oh, no, you're not. <laughs> we don't want to hear about that. Um, and then I got to the end of, you know, what I, I thought was a book of essays. And I said to Picador, I've written a book of essays. And they looked at it and they said, Oh, well, we think you might have written a job memoir. And that's a good thing. Because job memoirs are coming in, you know, there's um, the Adam Kay book and the Secret Barrister, and so we're going to we're going to make this into a into a job memoir. So that was um, how it came to be. It was really a long gestation. It was because um, we took a kind of a detour when uh, we were published England's group poems from a school as well. So it's um, it's been ten years in the making. But like, like everything, it started with particular impulse on on a you know from a particular child so I think that the two pieces that started it off were Shakila's head which is about a young Afghan woman and um, the Simon's baby which is about teaching in the inclusion unit and, and the pregnancy those were the first pieces I wrote uh, how did it how did you you choose the the children who were involved um, well the I mean I'm not very good at sort of theoretical things so the, all of the things in the book are about things like setting and class and um, being foreign. And they're all stories that are told through children who were particularly, who told me something through their you know, through the experience of knowing them, I, I learned something. And they're just children that moved me very much, you know, that I remembered. So some of them are kind of funny stories, like the, the funny story at the beginning about the the dog and the sex education class in Pennycook, that one of those war stories that you produce and polish for people. But a lot of them are kind of more private things than that, people and just interactions that we had. Um, and then when I, ha I was writing about the child, I did, you know, um, disguise them. The, these, are, these are slightly scenes for a fisheye lens, these children, so that they're not exposed fully. Um, you once said that, um, this is a quote from you, um, I always thought of teaching as my vocation and writing as a bit of a holiday from it. Uh, what is it about... <laughs> What is it about teaching that's so special to you? And, and how do you think the public perception of the two jobs, the writer and the teacher, varies? Well, writers um, have more prestige. You know, I found that out. They've, they're almost equally badly paid. I think writers are probably worse paid than teachers now, which um, wasn't always the case. It used to be the case that when I, I used to go and write journalism in the summer for the Scotsman up at the Edinburgh Festival, and it was a sudden you know, upping in my prestige. And people asked my opinion instead of telling me how to do my job. This was when I was 25. And I thought, oh, well, there's definitely something going on here. You know, there's a mix, because journalists are basically not very useful and teachers are very useful. But people do look down on teachers. Um, it's, I think it's because it's done by women um, and it's quite a messy job. You know, you, you get, you do get personally insulted in teaching in a way that doesn't happen to anyone else. You do, you know, you, you take personal pain and personal takings down that no other professions do. But I think it's a social class thing as well. I think it's because it's the first profession that working class people go into, you know, the first thing. Um, and because it's dominated by women, but definitely it has a lower social standing than, than other professions, and people tell you what to do. 
in, especially government and politicians, tell you what to do to an extraordinary extent. Mm. So, I mean, the book was awarded the Orwell Prize for Political Writing, um, and there was a strong shortlist uh, that year. And you've won many awards, but how important was this one to you? Uh, and I really you, wanted this prize. <laughs> were, were you aware that of it as a political book when you were writing it? Oh, I always thought it was, yeah. And I, I, I thought of all of those, you know, from a feminist point of view, that the what women do and those caring things are important. Um, and from a, you know, um, the teacher's straightforward political sort of um, point of view, that this is. These are the actions of the non upper middle class when all the time, you know, so much power is now concentrated in the hands of a very few. Here's the education of everybody else. It's so important what happens. And also from a straightforward political point of view that the decisions of Michael Gove had a massive impact on my life, you know, and I wanted to, to write about them. So I always thought of it as a political book. Um, and I was so grateful to the All Foundation because, you know, really, I'm a middle-aged woman and what happens to middle-aged women is they get disregarded most of the time. So to have me and my views and my teaching experience given a big central award like that, I could not have been more grateful and delighted. Would you say that um, uh, how, how um, much is education uh, political? Very political, yeah. Um, it's the, in a way, it's the cheapest thing that politicians can think of. You know, They're, they think oh, it's been in the news this week. OK, there's a mental health crisis. We'll put some counsellors in schools and we'll tell everyone to be well is an example of that. You know, they, they spend a little bit and they push the money in or they tell teachers to do this or they tell people. You know, it's partly it's an inexpensive way of seeing to be done doing something and it, it's quite actually to this in this country gets done more than other countries that get used as an absolute political football. But there's also in Britain, there's such a huge historical divide um, in the, the schools that everyone doesn't go to the same school, the schools that people go to, the class politics, the people who are doing the telling are not the people that are the parents in your school or the people that went to your school. So I, I do think it's a very political and divided um, area. Yeah. I mean, it's a political and divided area here as well, um, Kate, because at the moment we've um, finally, um, in my opinion, thank goodness, got rid of the 11 plus selection scheme. And, um, and Well, that's going to be fun times, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> the fun has just started, really, because now we're trying to yeah. work out the best way to, to deal with, with the result. But anyway, yes, education is political <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Um, yes, I'm sorry. that will be a very drastic few years you'll have. Um, you'll now, have can we, um, I'd be really interested, at the beginning of the, your talk, you mentioned Shaquille's head. And when I was um, reading this book, I was very moved by that particular section. That You called it an essay, mm. that story. And I wondered if you would read that section for us. Yeah. Okay, sure. So th this is shows you what's really because um, it's one of the first books. I think every book's got a kernel. You know, when you when you start a book of poems, there's a kind of starter poem, and if there's a novel, there's kind of a starter scene, you know, or a moment. Um, and this is the kind of the the core of this book, and it's um, it's just a, a true story about um, a, a, a girl I met, and I'll tell you about her at the end about what happened to her next, um, and it's about how I got to know her. So she's um, from Afghanistan. And this is when I was just getting going with my little poetry group. And I had a group of girls. Um, I did a lunchtime group of girls who all came from other countries. Shaquilla's head. It's sports day and Shaquilla slips from the shade behind the library, blinking in the sun. Miss, I wonder again what Shaquilla does to a hijab and why it seems to sit fuller and higher than the other girls. A mother superior hijab, or one from a vermeer, stressed arched. Maybe it's draped over twisted horns of hair like Carrie Fisher's in Star Wars. That would go with her furry eyebrows, her slanting, sparking black eyes, her general Mongolian ferocity. Miss, cries Shaquilla, I won the 400 metres. You did? Isn't it Ramadan? Aren't you fasting? Shaquilla nods. I still won. And miss, 
I'm coming to poetry group after the hurdles. Here, poem. She hands me a sheet of A4 and dashes back onto the playing field. It is 28 degrees and getting hotter. Under her rugby shirt and long trousers, Shaquille grows thin. The poem, though, is very fine. A variation on a theme I gave the group last week, contrasting the morning Adhan from the mosque in her native Afghanistan with the morning Alarm of her life in England. I'm more interested, though, in the writing on the other side of the sheet, which she has crossed out with a single line so the whole text is still visible and begging to be read. It's about a man sweating and a scarf and a backpack and suspicious minds. So when, because of sports day, just Lily, Priya and Shakila turn up to poetry group, I ask her about it. Oh, she says, I was trying to write, you know, about terrorists. What about terrorists? But I couldn't make it work. Miss, it was too hard. Terrorists here in this country? I'm assuming the poem is a protest against suspicion of Muslims in Britain. I'm aware there is a group of Afghans in the neighbourhood now. The local cafe has a new name and a map of Afghanistan on the wall and an invitation to order a whole sheep 24 hours in advance. I got into a discussion with the cook about the poet Rumi. He looked just like Shakila, come to think of it, so maybe... No, miss, says Shakila, eyes snapping, ivory fingers blossoming in scorn. In England? There are no terrorists in England. She's from Afghanistan, says Lily. She means the Taliban. Lily is an alternative type, a goth with heavy eyeliner who always knocks about with the black girls. Nevertheless, I assume this is a white stereotype and I'm about to correct her when Shaquille nods more vehement than ever. Miss people. Like the kite runner, says Lily glancing at me smugly. I don't know, says Shakila. It's a book, I say, about Afghanistan. It's on the A-level, isn't it, Lily? The Taliban, says Shakila, hate us. When my mum went to get our visa, miss, the bus was bombed. Not her bus, but the one in front. Miss, I thought she would never come home. But, says Lily, I thought you was Muslim. She offers me a monster munch. Usually, at poetry group, Shaquille brings us cherries and strawberries, shining like the roses in her cheeks. She and Priya are pale today. I am Muslim, says Shaquille. I am Shia. What's that? asked Lily. I raise an eyebrow. Clearly, this wasn't in the kite runner. A different kind of Muslim, I supply, like Protestant and Catholic. The Taliban hate the Shia, says Shaquille flatly. They kill us all the time. Priya leans across the table. Her hijab is soft, striped and biblical, like in a nativity play. Her teeth in braces, her face as so often full of delicate feeling. She is from Bangladesh originally, a Sunni. Miss, she says, but she's talking to Shakila. When I found out about that, when I learned there are other kinds of Muslim, I didn't believe it. I said to my teacher in the mosque, this is not true. How can this be? There is only one Quran, says Shakila. There is only one Allah. Priya says, Miss, don't laugh. When I was a little girl, I thought the television was true. I mean, the black and white. I thought the past was black and white, Miss. I thought England was black and white. When I found out about Shia and Sunni, it was like that for me. I mean, when I found I was wrong. You should write that down, says Lily. This is poetry group. How old was you when you came here, Priya? Six. Me, I was 14, says Shakila. Sunni, Shia, there is no difference really, says Priya. Just some prayers. Wait, do you whip yourselves? No, snorts Shakila. I mean, not really. It is a uh, thingy, a symbol. She leans her hijab to Priya's hijab puts her hands across the table. You know, she says, in my country, they caught this terrorist, this bomber. They put him on television. He said he was doing it for the Taliban, but he didn't know anything. He did not know. And she breaks into Arabic, sharp and triumphant. Asalumu alaikum. Asalumu salam ramatala, chimes in Priya. 
and both girls bow their heads. What's that? asks Lily, and Tranquilla gazes at her. A salutation, she says. A Muslim says it to a Muslim. Everyone knows that. Except the Taliban fighter didn't know it, I say, or not with a gun to his head. But, says Lily, this bloke, the Taliban bloke on the telly, was he the same as in this poem? No, says Shakila, this was another one. Priya raises her head. How can a Muslim hate another Muslim? Miss, it is terrible, miss. A real terrorist, says Lily, in your poem, like you met him. Yes, says Shakila. I saw him on the street in the market and I had this feeling he is wrong. He is sweating. He wears all these clothes. What clothes? Like, you know, jacket, big thingy, scarf, big trousers. It is hot. It is summer. I had a feeling. Run away. Run away from this guy. I catch my friend's hand. We run. Yes, says Lily. But was he real? A real terrorist? Yes, says Shakira. Real. I ran. I screamed. I ran. Everyone ran. There was an explosion. I was hiding behind a thingy wall. He was in a bomb. He exploded. You heard it. Boom. And then the bell rings for a long time and we flinch from its noise. Priya says, you need a frame for your poem. Miss, give her a frame. A frame. They've learned my mantra. A frame, I say every week. Try this poem shape, this form, this bit of rhetoric, this frame. Never tell me about, certainly not, unload your trauma. And still, they tell me these terrible things. Yes, says Shakila. a frame. How shall I? I haven't the slightest idea. Shakila folds her hands on her bag, waits. That, says Lily, was a really good discussion. I reckon we should have filmed it, like for RE. I have to go. And she goes. So does Priya, leaving me to search my mind for the right frame for a poem about recognising a terrorist in the marketplace and then running away. Shakila says, Miss, you know, bombs, Miss. The worst thing is they cut you. They cut off bits of you, Miss, like your feet, your leg. And when the bomb goes off, Miss, those thingies, body parts, I suggest, automatically. Yes. Shakila's eyes brighten as they do when she cites a really fine piece of vocabulary. Body parts. Body parts and in the town around. Did that happen, that bomb, I ask? The bomb in your poem? Did you see that? Miss, she says, there was a head. A whole head. His head, I ask. The terrorists? Just, she says, you know, a head. Right, I say. I look at the sunlight coming in the slabs of the blinds and I suggest that the interrogative mood might be good for poems like this and short lines probably and regular stanzas, a ballad perhaps, or a set of instructions. How to recognise a terrorist. Shakila says she will send me the poem by email. And she leaves and I sit and stare and listen to the roar of the children finding their classrooms, the silence as the doors close and the register is taken. This is an orderly school, I remind myself, a just one, a safe one. As Lily said, it is beautiful to see Shakila and Priya extend hands across the table. More people should know. Then I think I will go to the staff room and find someone to tell. There will be someone there, someone to listen and to counter with some equally horrifying tale, and we will rehearse all the interventions available all the help school extends, which is good help, the best available anywhere, the best anyone can do. We will remind each other this is why we work here, why our school does so well, our multicultural intake, our refugee pupils, so very often brilliant, so, in the modern parlance, vibrant. But it won't do any good. 
In my ears is the sound of a bomb, a homemade one, a glass and fertilizer one, in a small town in Afghanistan, and it sounds like the school bell. And here on the desk, disguised as a sheet of A4 paper, is a head cut off at the neck, its eyes shut, its bloodstains minimal, its skin greenish like John the Baptist on a plate. Shakila's head, in its elaborate hijab, for how else am I to picture the Hazara people, Persian speakers, lovers of the poet Rumi, eaters of apricots, guardians of the Buddhas of Bamiyan, other than as my dear, my swift-running Shakila. Does she feel the light of it, lighter of it, I wonder? Now it is me who has to carry the head home? Or will it be equally heavy, however often it is passed, just as much a head? Well, we can find out. Shakila's head, the weight of it, the warmth, the cheekbones, the brains. Here you are. Catch. <clears throat> That's um, a really, really powerful piece of writing. And, and you know, I can feel uh, I can feel the sort of emotion building up as as we know really where it's going to go. Is that something? Um, is that something that you had to deal with quite a lot? You mentioned that people of, of often had stories to tell you, um, quite disturbing stories sometimes. Um, what, were there many that you had to deal with, and how did you deal with them? Well, the, yeah, there were many because there were many. Our school was a destination of many refugees, um, so the it, it, it's a very it's a very kind, good school, um, and we're near camps. Oxford is a place of much employment, um, and there are many communities settled there. Partly because we had the, the camp camps filled for a long time um, nearby, and Oxford was the first multicultural place that those communities could go, and you know they came. So we had Syrians, and Afghans, um, and Eritreans, and Somalis and Tanzanians and all kinds of people who had suffered all sorts of um, terrible things and Nigerians as well. Um, that I'd just like to reassure you that that um, Shakila in, in real in real life um, she did wonderfully well. She stayed on next year at school, she got A levels, she got a sanctuary scholarship to Goldsmiths University in London. She got first and she's currently studying at the LSE, just finishing up, and then she's going to go and work for non-governmental organisations and help her people. So she really did very, very, very well. And her poems are set on the syllabus in Pakistan in English. Isn't that great? Oh, fantastic. So she's doing, <laughs> she's doing fantastically, yeah. Poetry I, will take you everywhere. I was also, uh, when I was reading the book, really interested in, uh, from a, it's obviously a different background, but the young man called Alan, who, who was one of your, um, your young poets quite early on. And he wasn't you, really a poet, Alan. Well, he, he liked poetry. Yeah, he's my student. <laughs> but you traced him years later, 30 years later, to find out what happened to him and, and how well he'd done. And that also was a really good story, wasn't it? And yeah, well, but that, 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 that was about, you know, so Alan was wasn't wasn't certainly wasn't a refugee. He came from a, um, a you know one of those families in Essex. He was kind of Jack the Lad. He wasn't the kind of person you would think would like poetry, um, but he loved it. He loved Blake. He he had a complete vision of it. And I, I, I was you know I was very fond of him. And I dug out his GCSE coursework and looked at it, and it was so eccentric. You could have only done it on coursework, and it was so passionate and slightly crazy and it got an A for it. And I wondered, I just looked him up and I wondered what happened, what happened to that sort of very personal passion for poetry in somebody so unlikely. And he, you know, he bought the damn company. He was in charge of several people. He was doing incredibly well and he was still a reading person and he, he still listened a lot to podcasts. He still cared a lot about stars and astronomy and he still remembered my lessons and he still remembered that, that thing that, that, poems and you could write poems and you could think about it so it was just lovely to have that from a different you know from the other aspect it doesn't have to be you know Shaquille it can also be um, Alan from Essex you can also have those other stories I think it's <clears throat> as a teacher it's always good when uh, when you're walking down the street and somebody that you 
almost don't recognize comes up to you and shakes your hand and say, says yeah, no, how I they've think. enjoyed your lessons. Isn't it wonderful? Of course, <clears throat> if yeah, they didn't... Well, if they didn't enjoy them, they're not likely to come and talk to you, are they? Well, sometimes the, the people who were actually very mean to you come and say, I'm sorry about that, I did like it really, yeah. Or quite unlikely people. I remember a girl coming who, I, you know, I didn't really think she'd noticed very much at all, and she came and said, I really miss your lessons, miss. There isn't any poetry in the bank. And I always thought that was, you know, that, that it's lovely that at least, she, at least she took that to the bank, the idea that there were poems in the world. Oh, look, um, the book, you call the book um, Some Kids I Taught and What They Taught Me. <clears throat> now, what you taught them is is obvious, but what did they teach you, Kate? I think you just endlessly learn humility. Um, I mean, you are humility often when you start teaching, which is not very constructive. But I, I learned to... to estimate children much more highly. Um, I learned to think that almost anyone could write a poem. Um, I learned, I mean, I learned very practical things. Like I didn't know all the names of the different languages and communities in Afghanistan until I started teaching in my school. Um, I didn't understand the Sunni Shia conflict in the Middle East until I met people that were involved in it. So I learned, you know, those things. But I think you just learn endless respect, respect for your students and respect for their parents. Um, and respect for all of these different stories that can be told, um, and not to not to people, not to judge. It, it, it's a great, huge education in not judging. An exhausting education in not judging. Uh, turning back to the <laughs> politics of education slightly. Um, now, you, you, and I know this because I went on a course when you were the tutor, you, very inspirational, creative writing teacher. And I was just wondering if you think that the teaching of creative writing is being phased out of the curriculum, uh, or is it being uh, given less priority than it should be? It's really, in English teaching in general is in a very sad place. Um, you know, right from, I don't know how it is in Guernsey. They, I, know, I know things are slightly different and you maybe have a little bit more autonomy, but um, the, I mean, fewer people are studying English. We can start with that. A-level English is becoming so unpopular that in some places it's not even taught anymore. And it used to be as big as maths. Now it's much smaller than maths. It's much smaller than psychology at A-level. So something's going wrong. People aren't choosing it anymore. Um, and if you look at what's happening to students, you can see why they're not choosing it because um, right from children aren't allowed to write, they aren't allowed to imagine, they aren't allowed to compose things in a natural way. Um, everything goes on to this very dry um, activity of literary criticism, which is they do it in an extremely dry, repetitive and learned way. It's really, really sad because, you know, people study psychology because they want to understand about people's feelings. And you used to do that in English. English is about feelings. English is about stories. And English is about making. And I think, you know, for for me, reading and writing are just related activities. Well, you know, I get... I never write a poem with students without showing them. That's all I do. That's what my book, Grow Your Own Poem, is about. It's about read a poem, write a poem, read a poem, write a poem. And it's how people do it. Um, and those those activities shouldn't be divided. And they are divided. Um, and it makes English teachers' lives hard. It makes primary teachers' lives hard. And I suppose most of all, it takes that joy away from children. Because you know, remember writing a story when you were little. It was the best thing ever, wasn't it? Why would you ever yeah. want to do anything else? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, I think uh, <clears throat> that's absolutely true. And also what comes out in the book, of course, is um, is that an awful lot of children in, who maybe um, aren't suited to the analytical form of English teaching absolutely mm. love writing poetry, or they absolutely love absolutely. writing. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So it's got lots to say, and then they yeah. completely miss that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there we are. Uh, so um, do you think that uh, you, when you started, there's a bit early in the book where you started, uh, you mentioned that you wanted to change the world, Kate. You, you said you went into, you went into teaching I because you do. wanted... Damn it. Yeah. Is there a prescription for... How do you go about that? Oh, I just kind of... I go kind of generally at it with all fists flying... Um, you know, not not very effectively. I'm, I I want to make the world better for everybody, and obviously that you're not very good at doing that. 
but the thing about teaching is that you you usually have a good day you know you go in and that's why I like teaching in schools really so if I go in and do poetry in schools then I can come away and some people will have written some good sentences or they'll have you know they'll have told me something and had a bit of comfort you know it's not you don't have to do a lot to to have a good day and be a bit useful um so yeah I think it's the I think if you if you have a need to change the world it's a great place to go it's your local school I, I like the, the, the other thing about the Orwell Prize is the Orwell Prize is a prize for political writing, but they always emphasise that the word writing is uh, almost as important as the, the politics. And um, this, the book is, is beautifully written, and you've read um, Shaquille's head to us. But there's lots and lots. Of, I started actually underlining bits that I really liked. And uh, after about four <laughs> or five pages, I just got fed up of it because there were so many of them. But there's um, a, a lovely bit in there um, uh, early on about Miss, the way people are called mm. Miss. And I wondered, would you like to read that yeah, to us? To, you, but just before questions, yeah. So th this is about, because um, in, in Scotland, you're not called Miss. So I, w I wasn't used to it. Um, and um, I got a shock when I was I found I was called Miss. Um, and then I started to read, I, I read um, this part, this one, this, this shows how long, there was an article in the paper saying how every so often somebody says it's a, it's a sexist thing to call people, but I don't think it is. I think it's just a sort of bit of a class marker, really. Miss. Miss, I've heard so many professional people express distaste for that name, but never a working teacher. Usually the grounds are sexism, but real children in real schools don't use miss with any less or more respect than sir. Miss grates only on the ears of those who've never heard it used well, as it grated on me as a middle-class Scot 30 years ago. No longer. Miss is the name I put on like a coat when I go into school. Miss is the shoes I stand in when I call out the kids in the corridor for running or shouting. Miss is my cloak of protection when I ask a weeping child what is wrong. Miss is the name I give another teacher in my classroom in the way co-parents refer to each other as mum or dad. Miss seems to me a beautiful name because it's been offered to me so often with love. That's so lovely. That's part of my introduction. <laughs> now, you've kept your, um, your poetry group has kept going, is that right, through the lockdown? Yeah, well, it's sort of morphed, though. That's the thing about Zoom. It, it, it's been great for doing one-to-one -one with kids who were already committed, and I have managed to kind of keep that going. But I haven't got new little ones, and I do miss, you know, being in school. I hope that we can... Obviously, a cross-curricular after-school group in all-year groups is the last thing that one's able to do. Um, but I have kept up with the older ones, and we wrote a book called Unmute, which I'm, I can show you. There we go. Um, nope. And it's, I think it's one of the best records of the lockdown there could be. That's us on Zoom. Everyone did a self self portrait. Um, but they wrote <laughs> astonishing things over 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 lockdown. Do you think the lockdown? Um, but you know, I mean, you've obviously judged our poetry competition, and as you know, we've had a uh, record entry, but by a long way, yeah. uh, 2,000 entries, yeah. and, and you spent an awful lot of time reading an awful lot of those as well. <laughs> yeah. well it's and very difficult, because lots of them were very, 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 very good. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's marvellous to know. And, and also, actually, there's yeah. a lot of, lot of people who enter that competition. When you live in a small place like Guernsey, you tend to know who the poets are, but there were an awful lot of people that we didn't know who were writing really good poetry. That's that's wonderful. Yeah, but do you think? Did the, I just hope everyone feels seen. Do you think um, that uh, the lockdown has had an effect on 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 the writing of poetry? Certainly. I mean, I think it was brewing. Um, young people don't hate poetry anymore, except for the, the kind they do at GCSE. It's really moved on to, there's loads of poetry on TikTok, there's loads of poetry on Instagram and Twitter. I mean, obviously it's variable, but then, you know, ballads were popular in the Victorian era and some of them were rubbish as well, but it was, there still, there was more popular. Poetry is being consumed and read, especially by young people, more than at any time in the last hundred years. Um, and the, I think um, the lockdown gave it a kick, you know, as, as so many other things did. So yeah, I think it's um, it's 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 a great time for all of that. 
And, I, and want, so, I want to do a proper workshop in a proper room soon, though. <laughs> yeah, with real people. Tomorrow. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. With, with real people. Yes. Actually, you've got some real people. You're one-to-one, I think. Yeah, uh -huh. but you, it's difficult to agree with. Yes, yeah, yeah. But actually, you're speaking to real people here, so we've got a real audience. I'm not sure if you can do Hello, that. I think I, I, I think, okay. yeah. Um, no, uh, <laughs> there was, I was also interested, this made me uh, smile in, in the book, um, as a former English teacher, um, you had a bit of a go at Walt. Um, and yes, uh, <laughs> we are learning too. And I don't know if, yeah. if non-teachers are aware of Walt. Uh, you have to now write your learning objectives, don't you, on the board? And Walt is a way that you put them. We are learning too. So at the end of each lesson... I think anyone which, that did teaching over lockdown, then they became much more acquainted with those things. Okay, yeah. Walt. And do you think, though, that things like that, especially in, in English... Uh, do they are they too prescriptive in the in the teaching of English? Oh, I, I just think it's not sensible, and we it, it doesn't work for English. I mean, there's a lot of theories that are now placed on education, uh, which are to do with them. Um, everything should be knowledge based, and you should have tests for everything. But English is a discipline. English isn't a set of answers. English is not a set of knowledge. English is a, is a conversation. It's um, a way of being in our culture. And it's not taught well taught by lesson objectives. You're, the lesson objectives will always miss. But they're, they're you know they're they're a waste of time, um, and they're a waste of time at best and destructive at worst. And we really need to have more confidence in our subject mm. and teach it. Teach. So what would be? <laughs> let's say you're talking to uh, as someone with thirty years experience. You're talking to a um, a new uh, teacher, young teacher about to start. Would I'm going to spring this on you? Um, what would be your your advice to them? Well, I mean, I, I did run a series of CPD workshops with young teachers last year, um, and I do meet them. I, you know, I try to say to them, have confidence in literature, have confidence in yourself, have confidence in your creativity and your children's creativity, and that if you are writing together and reading together, you will be learning. Um, but it's very difficult because you're basically you're telling them to be subversive in that way. Mm. Mm. Right. Um, look, we've got we've done 45 minutes, Kate, and we're going to have to um, wrap it up. But we want to, it's any we can open to questions from the floor. So I mean, it's been a it's marvelous to get your thoughts. Not only because not only are you um, an accomplished writer, but you're also a really good teacher. So the two the two mix really well. So um, have we got any questions from from the floor at all? Now, if I was in my teaching mode, I would say to the children now, you should have been thinking of these questions before we finished. <laughs> yes, John. There's a microphone coming to you there. Hello. Very interesting to hear you, your, your readings tonight and your choices for the judging. Uh, but speaking as a politician myself, who's part of the <laughs> education changes, uh, one defense I'd make of political interventions in education, incredibly, we're reinventing for Guernsey another curriculum, having only changed the curriculum a few years ago for the <laughs> island, not using the Scots or English one, but moving on from that. It isn't the pressure put on politicians who then put it on to teachers, coming from, in many respects, box pop, the the public and the media who are constantly saying, despite evidence to the contrary, something's going wrong in education and using education as a blame game rather than, say, class or inequality or other issues. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I absolutely, there was a huge amount of pressure, but there's a huge amount of pressure that comes on other things as well, you know. Um, a huge amount of pressure comes on medicine to, to solve problems instantly. Um, do, people are a lot less eager to tell doctors what to do. I think um, there's a thing about education that it's a very beaten down, soft target, and that teachers are very easy to monster. Um, by you know, right wing and left wing, people tend to tell you that you're wrong. Um, and you wouldn't, I mean, people, you simply would not tell doctors that they should prioritise 
one kind of illness over another. And we can see that very dramatically in the pandemic when we, we defer to what the doctor's opinion is on everything. Uh, that is not true of teaching. You know, we the, things like the um, emphasis on parsing in in um, year six in England, that is nobody's advice, no teacher's advice, no educational expert's advice. It was simply the prejudice of a politician and it's affected a whole generation. That doesn't happen in medicine and in other things. Mm. Hello, um, I'm coming from the live stream. We've got Roz on the live stream asking, what is the youngest age you've worked with for writing poetry? She said, fascinating talk. Um, well, I, there, there is there is this book called Take Off Your Bra Brave by little Nadim. I don't know if you've seen this, just came out. Um, have you seen this? It's so sweet. Um, so this is, uh, I, I, I personally am fairly scared of four-year-olds, but anyway, um, my colleague um, Yasmin was looking, gone into head, I was working with her with some refugees and helping her with some teaching techniques. Um, and then she had to go in, into her child's nursery school. And so I adapted a technique for them and her little boy Nadim started to write some very adorable poems. And I put them on Twitter and now he has a book. <laughs> so um, yeah, four, I suppose. Is my, uh, is my youngest. But I'm not a great primary school expert. People put me in with year four and five and they ask me if they can go to the loo and sharpen their pencils. And, um, you know, I am baffled as many secondary school teachers are. I can see some primary school teachers having a laugh. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How, how well, many people, just, just out of interest, how many people here are teachers? Oh, we've got quite a few. Kate. And I think there's a, a couple on the live stream as well. Yeah. Yes, a question over there. Just wait for the microphone. Just a second. Thank you for that. It's lovely to hear your readings and it's, it's lovely to um, hear your passion for teaching and your passion for English. And uh, I, I'm really saddened and disturbed by uh, the sense of um, anger that at, uh, that I can also hear in the, in the tone of your voice and, and, and so forth when you talk about the demise of, of English and the lack of um, a policy that's driven by teachers perhaps who are, who are the experts. And, um, you know, we, 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 I don't want to bring it away from your books, um, but it is really important to us on Guernsey that English and education is led by teachers. And so what can um, our community do to listen more to teachers who are passionate about English um, to make sure that English stays a, a subject that kids want to um, continue to study and perhaps pursue a career in teaching in the future? Um, well, I think you've got curriculum, so that's a good start. You're, you're, you're not doing the, the English English UK curriculum, so that, that's something else. I, don't, I believe you haven't got government trusts here, um, academy trusts here, is that correct? We don't have, have got state academy. Run? You don't have academies, so that's, no. that, that's a really good thing because they're responsible for some, not all of them, but some of those chains are responsible for some pretty cheap policies, so you're doing really well there. Um, you're about to bring your students together in in comprehensives if that if is that right yeah so let let english be the subject talk about what it feels like write about what it feels like and you read about your feelings um and let the kids write and read and create and and um they will be grateful for you you know document what's happening to you listen to yourselves um give yourself some credit i do think teachers just give all the time um and if they have time for their own creativity and if they give themselves credit for their own creativity then they often do better you know they feel better and they teach better as well teachers give to you know i do know for myself that teaching and writing come from the same place you can't actually do both of them full pelt you have to adjust and do one and the other thank you Hi there. Um, thank you so much. It's really inspiring as somebody who is in non-formal education. I wanted to build on what you've just touched on. Do you feel that there's a place or how could there be a place where English actually straddles lots of subjects, 
because actually, although English literature or language can be a single subject, you could be talking about it in religion or sex ed or science, whatever. Like, have you seen good examples and what would you advise for that? Thank you. Well, I think you know, the, the, adv the advice, that, that's just there in the past. Um, primary schools used to have much more unified curriculums. Um, I think it's one of the weird things we do as a nation is um, take children at 11 and put them into secondary schools into a very, very divided curriculum with many, many teachers. Often they would do better if they had fewer teachers and more unified subjects, if they had more unified humanities and English, um, as they do in every other nation in the world. But so uh, that's one thing that we could do. We, all, we still have a lot of time for English. Um, it's just that we've narrowed it down so that we're aiming, often students spend three years preparing for the GCSE curriculum um, and writing very, very narrow, miserable, repetitive essays when they could be writing and reading all sorts of texts and enjoying them. Um, so just if we could just maybe step back a bit and go back a little bit in time, we could recover a better curriculum and a bit more self-confidence. That would be good. Sorry, I didn't know it was on. Um, hi, this is Camille. Firstly, thank you so much for ordering my poem. <laughs> and also, um, thank you for a really lovely talk as well. Um, one thing that really stood out for me throughout the talk and, and throughout um, your, your book as well was just your amazing attitude towards refugees in the UK and sort of welcoming people in, which unfortunately with sort of Brexit and a lot of the anti-immigration um, talk we've been hearing in the last few years and decades. Um, obviously, not, not a lot of people kind of share that attitude, but it's something I'm incredibly passionate about as well, um, especially as a lot of people in Guernsey in the 1940s were refugees as well. Um, so I think that's that's something that's really prevalent to us here. Um, what would kind of your advice be? And I know it's probably a big question, but when it comes to like some of the sort of anti-refugee sentiment that you that's been around in the last few years, particularly in sort of how to tackle that, particularly in an educational context? Well, I think we could um, listen to people. I mean, m my school did really well with refugees because we had enough staffing and money and e English as additional language teaching. Those are good places to start. Um, at, but, a, but a positive attitude means listening to people's stories and framing people's stories and having thinking that a multicultural environment is a good thing. And I would say that, you know, many schools in the south of England where, um, you know, actually not just in the south, but in Leicester and places like that, where they have proper multicultural schools, they've done incredibly well. Um, and the kids have done amazingly well. And everyone acknowledges that the source of the excellence in those schools is the, the multicultural environment. So you, they, they are engines of positivity and places where kids come together and deeply civilized and exciting places to be. So. The multicultural school in itself, it can be a wonderful engine of change if we, and we should celebrate that and say how fantastic they are. I mean, that's why I put England poems from a school together. It's, it, it's um, part, it's, I mean, they're, they're sad poems, but it's a very celebratory, whoops, got it upside down. It's, um, it's a celebratory book in that all these kids live together in a community and, and write together and have got so many things to say and give each other so much. So you know, celebrate it, enjoy it great places. Any other questions? Well, yes. You made a slightly disparaging comment about parsing in year six. Um, <laughs> and uh, I found actually children in year five and six sometimes do quite enjoy learning a bit of grammar. Um, is it is it a sort of a entirely against grammar? Just shouldn't be taught formally, or or does it have some use, um, in, especially in in communicating to them the kind of building blocks of, of language and therefore of composition? I don't think grammar is a building block of language. I think it's a description of the building blocks of language. Um, I think the building blocks of language are re are reading and writing and hearing and listening and talking. And grammar is the rather elaborate way that we've come around to describe it when we're teaching it as a foreign language. Um, I don't, I mean, when people say against grammar as if I was in favor of people writing incorrectly or not being fluent writers, which is not true. I just think that I just know actually from reading and writing and experience that um, that 
learning that learning that exterior language that meta language for talking about your own language is very very difficult for the majority of of kids and when they're young um you know actually below the age of 14 and not especially helpful and it takes an enormous amount of time an inordinate amount of time when they could be doing other things um so i no i don't i don't think the breaking up of sentences and the learning to call. If you call something a fronted adverbial, that's a term, it's not a particularly accurate term, it's a term taken from North America. It doesn't help children to build a sentence. If you want them to build a sentence with adverbs on the front, then show them some sentences with adverbs on the front and encourage them to imitate them, and they will. If you want them to build their vocabulary, then read, read to them a lot, because most vocabulary is best learned in country when they're young. A fact fact about young children is that they learn foreign languages much faster than we do, but not if you teach them to them through meta language. If you put a child in a context where they're hearing a lot of language, they will learn that second language very rapidly and very better, better than an adult. If you do that to them, if you teach them a, a, a language through a meta language, they will learn it very slowly and worse than an adult. And the, our own language operates in the same way, our language operates in the same way. So I'm not against grammar as such. I just don't think that's a valuable way to spend year five and year six. Um, oh, yeah. You talked quite a lot about frames and in your book as well. So I was, I'm mm -hmm. interested to know, English teacher, I'm interested to know if you would recommend any particular reading on that. I've got Rose, where did you get that read? But which I assume is the same sort of thing. I'm wondering if you've written yep, anything yep. about that or if you've got any recommended... I have indeed. I've written a whole book, as it happens. Hang on. There we go. So... Do tell. <laughs> there we are. As you ask, how to grow your own poem, which is um, all, my best, all my best lessons <laughs> in the list. Right, if we've Yeah, but got... Rose, where to get the red is a great book. If we've got uh, no more questions, if we've got no more questions, look, Kate, it's been wonderful to, to have you with us um, today, even if you couldn't be really here. Uh, it's been an inspiring talk, and you've left us with a lot to think about as well. And especially as I think, you know, we're at, we're at that stage where we're thinking about what we're going to be teaching as well, changing our educational system. So I'd just like to say thanks very, very much indeed. And hopefully you will be able to come over. Maybe we'll be able to have a... a Maybe a, get to um, Guernsey one of these days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you need but to come on... A, in the school. Yeah. Yes, yes. And, and go into our schools. It'd be fantastic if you could. Absolutely brilliant. So look, I'd like to... Oh, wait a minute. Have we got one more last question? No? Okay. Well, um, I'd like to uh, say thank you very, very much indeed for, for being with us today. It's been a great talk. Um, and thanks. And, uh, and let's all show our appreciation. Yes, <laughs> Okay. Thanks very much, Kate. Brilliant. Thank you. Right.